I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back to another Real Conversation. Today I'm with Daniel Alpert, who is a managing partner at Westwood and uh, also a senior fellow at Cornell. Dan, congrats on, on all that and all that you've accomplished. Uh, this is another cycle you indeed get to see. Don't know if, uh, if, if, you, if you saw it coming like, you know, from 5,000 miles away or not, but that's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting conversation to have, obviously, at this, at, at this you know, time of the cycle and I wanted to, to maybe just start with that like you know what you know what you think from a top-down perspective and then we'll get into some some topics well you live long enough you see everything right <laughs> and I guess this is this falls into the category of everything um, so you know one, one of the most interesting things that I think came out at the top of this was that you had a lot of people out there uh, talking about this being some sort of a supply shock um, and clearly, this is the world's mother of all demand shocks. Um, it's a complete stoppage of demand uh, across the world. Uh, you know, you, you usually look at these on a regional basis. Uh, we've never seen anything quite like it. I, I, would, I would go so far as to say it surpasses world war uh, because, uh, you know, in a world war situation, you, you have a great deal of uh, procurement uh, of military uh, equipment, and certainly there's no stoppage of of consumer demand, generally speaking, consumer demand isn't being met uh, because of diversion of production. So, you know, here you have a complete cessation of demand almost across the board. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's global. And I think that's something that uh, is, you know, we've never really experienced. And, and this is also a comment for those of you that don't know, Dan wrote a book called The Age of Oversupply. So, you know, to go from that, you know, obviously that perspective is, is critical when you, when you start to talk about the demand side of the equation. How do you put them both together? And actually, maybe is that a, 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 an entree for you to write another book? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the age of oversupply and incredibly under demand. I mean, the, 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 the problem right now is that the, the situation that we had before the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, has just been exacerbated, right? We now have, uh, we, we've lived in a world for the last dozen years if not more, uh, with an excess of labor, uh, an excess of production capacity, and an excess of capital relative to the demand for all three. Uh, and of course, now we, we've uh, decreased demand, at least uh, for the time being, uh, by an enormous number. And so as a result, uh, we're going to be in worse shape uh, coming out of this in terms of the uh, tsunami of deflation that one typically associates with oversupply. Mm -hmm. The only question is how fast we're going to bounce back out of it. Yeah. Well, the, uh, on, <laughs> on, on that, I mean, I've been, I'm back and forth. It's almost like, ground, well, it is like Groundhog Day every day here in the office because I'm basically in here by myself uh, with these guys behind the camera. And I just have, you know, conversation after conversation with the people that uh, you're familiar with, the institutional investors. And it's just like a back and forth. And, and, and when you have the same conversation over and over again, you start to think about new things, or at least that's how my mind works. And one of the themes that I want to bounce uh, by you is, is going f basically from peak cycle, you know, classic pro-cyclical behavior, like you say, peak labor, peak capital, um, access to it, the, the whole nine yards. You go from a, you know, a, a theme of, of just abundance to scarcity. And scarcity, you know, euphemistically or not, just people sitting in, you know, they're at home listening to this or you're doing it, uh, you know, as well. You're in your, in your apartment in New York. It's, it's, it's scarcity at its core. And, and I wonder, you know, how that, how, how you can go from one theme to another so abruptly. Well, I don't, I don't think we're, I don't think we're really going to be facing a whole lot of scarcity. I mean, one of the, one of the things I'm most worried about right now is what's going to happen uh, when China reopens. Now, by no means do I suggest that the reopening of China is going to be smooth. Um, but, you know, to the extent that they operated, you know, things like their steel plants all through the Lunar New Year before they shut down uh, for the virus, and they're going to ramp up capacity and production again when there's really no export market uh, to be found, they're going to have an enormous amount of inventory um, when the West reopens. Um, and my biggest concern is that inventory flooding markets. And so um, the, the, uh, if you look at, at currency imbalances right now, the dollar is screaming again. It's likely to continue to do that. Um, <clears throat> and you're gonna, you're gonna be in a, in a situation with, uh, you know, I think the default scenario really is heightened uh, export of, of deflation from uh, uh, China and other parts of the developing world to, uh, to the West. Um, that's just going to exacerbate what's been going on for uh, the last decade. 
Now, can you go through that? Um, you, know, you you just linked something that not everybody does, but you know the dollar uh, to deflation, the credit cycle all, all together, and where we're at procyclically from that perspective. Well, you know, the uh, obviously the the uh, a weaker dollar uh, would create greater propensity for inflation, a stronger dollar uh, for deflation, right? Because you are uh, you're able to uh, import uh, products cheaper, and your export base is eroded. Um, so you you have a uh, you've had a strong dollar scenario now for for many years. Uh, obviously, it, when we entered the so-called trade war with China, which wasn't much of a war, um, the Chinese quickly allowed the uh, the CNY to devalue against the dollar, or basically erasing. Uh, most of the, uh, uh, the the effects of the tariff uh, that enabled them to be continuously competitive uh, in terms of their exports. Um, Europe, of course, uh, being the, 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 the in the condition that it is, uh, which is now obviously exacerbated by the by the COVID crisis, um, you know, had uh, seen the euro devalue by an enormous amount as uh, post the uh, euro crisis. Um, and that made uh, industrial countries like uh, like Germany very very competitive uh, globally. And so, you know, the strong dollar was a was a negative uh, for the U.S. economy. It forced the U.S. economy further into depending on service uh, jobs and service uh, functions. Uh, the service positions that were created for the past uh, eight years or so. Uh, have been overwhelmingly low-wage, low-hour positions, uh, and that put us in a position as this crisis commenced to have you know tens of millions of very vulnerable jobs in sectors like leisure and hospitality and retail and so forth. Um, that, as a percentage of total jobs in America, uh, were much higher than they were uh, 15 years ago, uh, and certainly much higher than they were actually at the commencement of the Great Recession. Uh, so, you know, you, you have this uh, dollar uh, situation that translates into the employment situation that translates into credit, which is obviously, um, uh, you know, based on, uh, ca you know, the overall balance of capital in the world. Um, you know, that, that produces a very, very difficult environment for us right now uh, and uh, requires the kind of extraordinary policy interventions that we're seeing. Yeah, and I want to come back to that uh, and on the unemployment side, because that's where, obviously, you have uh, plenty of expertise. But just to finish on that Chinese piece and tying that, you know, their U.S. dollar-denominated debt, their developing deficit. Guys, if you go to slide 122, just so that people know what Dan already knows, where, you know, the trade-weighted dollar just broke out to basically a 25-year high. Um, and then on the, on the right side, we show, you know, what Chinese reserves have done. Uh, of this chart. I don't think you can see the charts, but I'm sure that these are emblazoned in your mind, Dan. Uh, but again, this moment of, of a strong dollar where the Chinese are beholden to, to it, so to speak. And then, then on slide 123, guys, you can show that deficit developing. And then just the reality that these Chinese reserve requirement cuts, um, you know, really haven't had that stimulative impact that they had uh, when and created all these, you know, oversupplies uh, when, the, when, the, when the Fed was devaluing the dollar, the dollar was weakening. Uh, both in 2016 and back, obviously, in uh, 2011. Um, again, is that, is that something that you think the world, you know, at least the people that you talk to, fully understand how hamstrung the Chinese are by a pervasively strong dollar, no matter what the Fed does? Actually, they're, they're, they're benefited by a strong dollar, not hamstrung by it. I hate to differ with you, but obviously, they are an export economy. They're trying to uh, maximize the market for their products. Uh, they're an economy that's driven predominantly by employment, right? They they need to add 10 to 12 million new jobs a year uh, in order to keep their population happy. Um, and in order to do that, they have to depend on two things, state-financed infrastructure for the most part, and their export economy. Um, and so in order to continue that export economy, they need a fairly weak currency and a fairly strong dollar and uh, they, they need to be able to make their exports attractive to, uh, to the rest of the world, which is what they've been doing. You know, the, 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 what the Chinese do domestically uh, in order to spur the infrastructure economy uh, is, you know, sort of not very important globally, simply because the Chinese currency is neither freely exchangeable nor freely convertible. Uh, 
uh, every dollar that we send to China uh, to pay for goods that we import uh, passes through a unit uh, of the uh, People's Bank of China known as SAFE. Uh, they receive the dollars and they pay out RMB or yuan to, uh, to the vendors. Uh, so that enables China to build up these massive uh, foreign currency reserves in dollars and euro and yen. Uh, without having to endure any pressure on their currency, which would be the result of what would happen in most pe most places, where if we were buying a product from the UK, we would pay in sterling. Uh, we would buy sterling, and that obviously would uh, increase the uh, the value of the sterling. So what China has done is sterilized its currency, uh, created a, a sort of an internal script uh, that. Uh, 1.4 billion people use, which is not a small number, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and and enables them to run uh, their economy as they see fit. Uh, not a really good deal for the West, uh, and has created uh, the kind of dislocations that we've seen uh, for the last, uh, you know, 15, 20 years. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't mean in terms of uh, quibbling on on the realities associated with their export demand. Obviously, that's why they're. You know, that's why they're mm -hmm. doing that. But if you, another slide, guys, if you pop that up there on slide 121, what I was showing is the, the dynamics between periods of dollar strength and um, you know, sec the inverse relationship to secondary industry growth uh, in China, which is where they've created epic levels of, of capacity. I mean, as you know, that was like 50% of GDP growth in China coming out of 2016 when they stimulated like they'd never had before. And, and again, that was during a, a weakening of the U.S. dollar. So. You know, our argument is that the weakening dollar allows them to stimulate more aggressively. Um, so I'm just talking about the PBOC's a actions. This morning, in fact, the PBOC you know, basically, yeah, I, I basically just, just, said what I thought that yeah, they'd just, say I, in that regard, which is the PBOC yeah. basically said, hey, look, you know, I know the Fed's going to Q QE infinity, but you know, we're not really willing to do that at this juncture. Yeah, well, I'll just go one step further. Obviously, with a, with a uh, weakening dollar, they're kind of forced to depend more on the infrastructure side of their right. economy, right? The, the domestic side of the economy. So the cause and effect issue, uh, you, we can quibble over you know, chicken and egg, which comes first. But at the end of the day, their reactions have been over and over uh, to try to tolerate uh, a stronger domestic currency, their currency. Uh, and every time they've tried to do that, they've sort of ended up on the short end of the stick, meaning their economy slows. and. They get very nervous and they 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 go the other way. But um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of misconceptions about the way China works. People uh, in the West tend to look at uh, at at the enormous amount of bad debt. There certainly is an enormous amount of bad debt. But you got to remember the the state is on both sides of this equation. Not only does the state still control, either directly or indirectly, a good deal of uh, production in uh, in China, but the banking system, again, directly or indirectly, is completely controlled by uh, by the state. And so taking bad loans off of bank balance sheets and recapitalizing them with this currency that is neither freely exchangeable or convertible is not a big deal. Uh, and they can do this ad infinitum, and they have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they're going to continue to do that. Do you think, um, longer term, do you think um, you know, some of us uh, talk quite a bit about a, a Chinese moment being a Japanese one? Do you think that the um, secular high for, for China was in 2007, 2008? Well, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I mean, if you, it depends on what statistic you're looking at. If you're looking at growth rate, yeah, probably you get, you know, there's no question if, if a country's starting from nothing and, yeah. uh, and they're trying to build, they're going to have an enormously high growth rate. Um, but uh, you know, China is has got a, a bench of, of labor that uh, you know you can say sort of Japan kind of had, but not really. Uh, and that is, you you still have non-urbanized population in China uh, of around uh, just under 600 million people. Those 600 million people are not at all tapped into the global economy. Uh, they're for the most part, uh, you know, on the farm, so to speak. Uh, and China is very, very concerned about not urbanizing them too quickly. The, all, all of the, the, the pressure that, that, that is on them to restrict immigration into urban environments, the permits and all the other things which people routinely violate, um, you know, is, it creates enormous social pressures. They can't find jobs for these people uh, in, in these urban environments uh, fast enough. 
Mm -hmm. um, so what they're trying to do is regulate the the urbanization of this enormous bench strength that exists within their economy. Uh, so they can continue to do that for a very, very long period of time without suffering any inflation because you just, you know, obviously to the extent inflation crops up, you just uh, tap into a little bit more of this low wage labor that exists indigenously. So it's it's not, you know, China's never going to uh, be a, a, in a situation where they're going to hit, you know, some massive Japanese style collapse. That's just the, the two situ situations could not be more more different. Uh, but the the uh, situation from the West's standpoint is incredibly ominous because you've got this economy that can just uh, continue to add uh, from its infinite resource of labor uh, mm -hmm. and uh, continue to, to, to build infrastructure and, and, and capacity uh, with that labor and with the uh, with, with the uh, uh, script that it that it issues domestically. Um, without concerns about uh, uh, runaway inflation or any other ill effects. You know, you, you translate that out of China and you start looking to some of the other post-socialist countries, and uh, especially when you consider the fact that, God forbid, uh, from an American perspective at least, uh, if India ever got its act together and, uh, and started to emulate China in the same way, um, you know, you'd be facing you know, a wall of non-urbanized labor that would you know, last 100 years. In terms of its ability to be integrated, yeah. Can you and can we pivot to, to that to that U.S. side of the problem you mentioned? You you said tens of millions of jobs, and and that's uh, in the area code of where we're at. We obviously don't know how many are going to be unemployed, but I mean, you started with the point that these are very low-paying jobs on a historical you know basis if you look back anyway. Uh, but can you flush that out in terms of this this moment? I mean, these numbers, Dan, as you know, like if, for bean counters like you and I, like these jobless claims number. Uh, you know, unemployment numbers, they're, they're, they're things that are completely off the page in terms of any historical context. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're losing jobs at an incredible clip because we shut down the economy. We, we put the economy into what I call the equivalent of a medically induced coma, right? right? We, we, we're, we're in a situation where we basically said, you know, let's knock everybody out and, and uh, fix the disease and then we'll revive everybody when it's all over. Um, the the number of of, uh, of jobs that you know I think are vulnerable in the first wave, and it's important to understand that this is not all going to happen at the same time. The first wave of jobs that's vulnerable are these customer facing service jobs, and uh, those jobs are in the obvious sectors. You've got you know fourteen and a half million people in production, non supervisory jobs, and leisure and hospitality sector alone. Um, that's an enormous increase over where we were. At the beginning of the Great Recession, even on a per, even on a per, per capita basis, um, and then uh, you know you've got uh, obviously the retail sector, uh, and and you've got other service sectors that simply have no purpose today with the economy shut down. So we count uh, with our job quality index, and if you're interested, you can find this information at uh, jobqualityindex.com. Um, we we count about uh, uh, 37 million jobs that are vulnerable across the country uh, to this first wave. Now, do I expect 37 million jobs to be lost? No. Uh, first of all, it's not going to peak everywhere. And as you know, there we still have states that, that haven't even locked down yet. So, you know, when you when you go into that, I would expect of those somewhere between 15 and 17, and I hope I'm right, because anything more than that would be pretty horrible. Uh, that's horrible enough. Uh, of those jobs will find themselves uh, terminated, mm -hmm. uh, at least for the short term. So then you have the, the, the next problem, which is uh, what happens when, you know, it's one thing for the auto salesman in the showroom not to have any customers because no one can show up. It's another thing for the auto dealer to get on the phone, call Detroit or call wherever uh, the auto plant is and say, listen, you know those cars that you were going to send me for the next four months? Well, don't send me any. I've got too many on my lot. I can't possibly clear them. Uh, so you better shut down your factory. Well. Mm -hmm. Now, and obviously, we, we do have factory shutdowns already, but I'm using that as an example. You take that to its extreme, and you then have uh, a big hit to what's left of our goods-producing economy, um, and that creates yet another wave of, of, of shutdowns. And those jobs are not included within that $37 million because, they're, generally speaking, are higher wage uh, and, and higher hour jobs. Uh, but we've, you know, we've become incredibly dependent 
on on these low wage, low hour jobs in this economy. We thought we were at full employment. What we were at actually, if you look at the hours work, and keep in mind, I just just to illustrate this for your listeners and viewers, um, you know the average. A job in the leisure and hospitality sector produces 26 hours of work a week. Mm-hmm. Well, it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out that it's an average wage of, you know, 15 or so dollars an hour times 26 hours. It's not a lot of money, and that's 14 million people, right? So, so you're you're, you're talking about just an enormous number of people who are on the front lines, whose jobs are being terminated as we watch, and uh, and who are not in good jobs to begin with. This is this is, by the way, one of the issues that came up in Congress, where everybody was looking at that $600 stipend uh, that was going to be added to state unemployment benefits. And, you know, some of the folks in the Republican Party stood up and said, well, heck, these people are going to be making more money than they were uh, <laughs> before, before they lost their jobs. And the answer is, you're damn right they will right. be. And, yep. uh, and, and, you know, the, the, obviously these benefits will be time limited, so uh, they're not going to... Uh, uh, cause them to stay out of work forever. But, uh, you know, it's very important that this money flows. Yeah. I mean, I laughed not because it's funny. I laughed because, you know, where I'm from in Canada, we call it pogey. Like, I'm from a small town in, in northern Ontario. <laughs> and look, you know, to, to get paid pogey and if it's fishing or hunting season, you might take that because there's more money in that than, than actually having a job on the service side of the economy. So I think that, I mean, that's an interesting, you know, you know, cultural fabric um, that, that comes into play with these bailout dollars. We'll get to that maybe a little later on. But I just want to flush out these bigger numbers that you have because you're very specific on them. You're one of the world's best at them. Um, so you go 14 million in this in service component of the economy. We've got 15 to 17 million is your estimate. 37 million is the vulnerable. So between the 17 million and the 37 million, how much of that is the second wave or the knock-on effect of you know, what is what you know, will be a sharp depression than a recession and, and how long it takes to work out of that. So just to clarify again, so the 37 was just the frontline jobs. Right. And the only reason that I'm limiting it to 15 to 17 million is I don't think every state will shut down. Okay. Uh, in uh, New York, for example. Uh, while, uh, uh, you know, countries in the heartland will be going through the worst of this. So, you know, the, it, it won't, won't reach a peak of 37 million. It'll be something below that. And also, not every job in these sectors is going to be lost. There's still going to be need for food service, delivery service, things like that, uh, even though the full-service restaurant might be shut down. So, you know, that, that's, I think, something to, to think about. Yep. But that 37 million that I articulated doesn't include any of the of the goods producing side of the economy. Okay. Um, and so, to the extent that uh, we lose 15 to 17 million in the frontline customer facing service side of the economy, and then that rolls over uh, into the goods producing side of the economy, you're talking about a much higher, higher number. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I haven't done my I haven't actually figured out what's likely to be lost on on the goods producing side. I'm just hoping we don't get there. Well, that's, I mean, that's literally, like I say, I go back to the Groundhog Day and all these discussions I have with different kinds of institutional investors. Most of them have come to the realization that we're not going to have a V-shaped recovery just because we went into the bad side of the V on the demand shock side. Um, a lot of them are talking about mm-hmm. the workout period. And I think that that's, that's really the scary thing is that a lot of businesses don't make money, to use the analogy. If you can't get a hotel back up to even 75% occupancy or a casino up to 85%, they're not going to gainfully employ anybody because the the place doesn't make any money. Um, And the same same could be said, you know, analog, obviously you mentioned restaurants. Um, Have you thought about that? Like how long, and and is there any possible way for us, um, in in my case, this this numb-headed human to to come up with a calculation on that when it's a nonlinear reality that has behavioral factors? Well, I think it, the the last words you just said, behavioral factors, are the most important. Um, you know, the, the the best example of this that I heard recently is obviously we're going to experience something akin to the Nike swoosh, right? Yeah. It's 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 <laughs> actually it's, I heard that in down. two calls yesterday. That must right. be going around. <laughs> right. But but okay. So the Nike swoosh. The question is, how swooshy will the swoosh be? Right. <laughs> so so the the uh, the the angle of the swoosh is is really important here. And that, I think, is going to be determined uh, to a large extent by um, uh, the fear factor. Yep. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things that I like to, to 
talk about now i'm not a medical expert by any means but i think i understand the 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 basic reality of what we're facing you know right now we need to find out who's sick we need to treat them so testing has been very important Uh, but in the nearer term or medium term testing is going to be less important we're going to need to find out who's been exposed Um, we're we're going to need to develop uh, dependable antibody tests there's a group up at mayo clinic uh, that is working really hard on this, that by no means the only group. There were a couple of tests that were rushed out in Europe, didn't work too well. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, between, uh, among all the scientists worldwide who are working on reliable antibody tests, uh, you're going to get something relatively soon. That's not a vaccine timeline. That's a multi-week timeline. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, being able to know, for example, did the fever that I had uh, uh, for, you know, 48 hours, didn't get even to a hundred, uh, degrees. Uh, but did that fever constitute my experience with this disease? Um, I have no idea. I, I hope the answer is yes, cause I'd love to have some antibodies, but, um, but you know, I, there are a lot of people who are asymptomatic who have mild symptoms. We don't know what they've got in terms of immunity. Mm-hmm. Those people are going to be very, very worried about showing up at your casinos or your restaurants or anywhere else um, that, uh, you know, uh, it, it will really create uh, significant problems in restarting the economy because that, you know, fear factor is going to be uh, quite prevalent. I don't, I don't envision uh, a picture of people standing around uh, the craps table with, with uh, surgical masks on. I just think they just won't show up. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, I, you know, I, I, I find it very difficult to, uh, uh, to believe that until we have some way of giving people confidence that it's okay to go back out with a reasonable blood test, um, you know, that we're going to be able to restart this engine that quickly. So like, I mean, on that, I mean, I think most people will agree that they're the, the behavioral side of this is just right gnarly. But if you, if you just take the vector of like history's lessons on what constitutes an actual depression in economic growth, guys on slide uh, 34, we could just, Dan knows this of course too, but um, you know, just the duration and the severity is kind of, is something that I, I often get in, you know, I first start to get in arguments when people start getting their ass kicked by the stock market. In the first month of the decline, that was more the debate. And then in the second month, there's more of this, okay, maybe this is real. Um, but quite literally, I mean, as you know, you have not had what I'd constitute a, a depression, which is something greater than a recession, going all the way back to the 1930s. And the workout periods there were many, 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 many months. I mean, Trump couldn't use another many to characterize how many more months you might have versus what he, he personally might hope for. Um, with the election coming. There wasn't meant to be kind of a poke at that, but I'm sure that you'll have some thoughts on that too. Um, what, what is it about an economic depression that mathematically makes the workout period just a long time? Well, I mean, the, the thing that is the main feature of an economic depression is obviously the thing that we're seeing today, a complete collapse in demand, right? right? And, and, uh, and, and so, you know, the, the thing that gave rise to uh, the collapse in demand in the 1920s was very similar to that which happened in uh, at the time of the Great Recession. The only difference was how we confronted it. Uh, there was no, uh, you know, three-year-long period, and the second uh, part of the uh, of the uh, or two-year-long period, the second part of the Hoover administration, uh, where they did you know pretty much everything they could do wrong, uh, and then you know the need for for FDR to show up and restart the engine by shutting it down at first. Uh, and then, and then starting square one, um, you know, that didn't happen in, uh, the great recession. We learned enough from the depression to, uh, to, to institute better policies. Some of those policies were in my opinion, nowhere near enough. In this case, we now have the lessons from both the great recession and the great depression. Right. And what that has done is it's gotten people, uh, people's eyes wide open. Uh, to look at uh, what, what needs to be done in terms of making sure that uh, this situation does not result in a true economic depression. Sure, we're going to see GDP in the second quarter fall by some hellacious number, um, and that's simply because nobody's out there spending. Uh, we're also going to see people to the extent they are still employed, uh, and even to the extent some of them receive uh, government uh, funding, uh, build up, uh, build up some savings, which is going to be have an interesting effect after the fact. Yeah. So 
the, the, the key is what the response is as opposed to what traditional you know, depression, depression economics was back uh, in the 1930s. Um, we're not going to see, uh, I hope, uh, you know, a protracted period where no one can find employment and nobody has any money. Um, you know, what the government has done, which I find extraordinary because uh, we, are, we, we have basically established a completely new paradigm uh, for the covenant between government and the people uh, relative to the last 40 years. And we're about to see whether this experiment plays out in a way uh, that's going to effectively change the way we look at the economy going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, you go back to TARP. I mean, I remember, I mean, back then I didn't have gray hair. Now this cycle, my hair is gray. Next cycle will be gone. I mean, it's just people were quite literally pulling out their hair uh, just to get to where we got to. And in, or by October of 08, it of course still didn't work for the market. But um, you know, to have that all happen in such a short period of time, I mean, there's so, there's, there's, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, I think, like you said, it's unprecedented. What do you think on that? Like, I mean, in turn, they're, they're, is that enough? With if, if 15 to 17 million people, uh, by my math, you know, just on a napkin, I could tell you that it's not. Uh, if if that's what you need to stop gap. I mean, is what the government has done thus far enough? I think the, the answer is no in right. the short term. Uh, but uh, the, the type of intervention that, that uh, has been undertaken in the CARES Act um, is exactly what was needed. And of course, it's expandable. Uh, as you know, McConnell went uh, back and is drafting a bill to expand uh, the, the PPP to uh, by another $250 billion. Um, you know, there's going to be plenty of money available, and there doesn't seem to be any reason to uh, to, to cease uh, the uh, amount of money that's available or to limit the amount of money that's available. The, the biggest issue here is understanding what's really going on, and that is that um, we are monetizing. We are uh, uh, we, we issue the currency that uh, that we print. Uh, and it's ours to issue, and to the extent that we want to issue it and hand it to households as opposed to use it to bail out banks, uh, we're going to be a lot closer to fixing the situation than we were when we expected all that money to somehow trickle down through the banking system and out out the door to uh, to, to, to borrowers who really weren't there at the time during the uh, during the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this this is a far more immediate, hands-on, uh, remedy than has been attempted before. Um, and, uh, you know, I would, I would argue uh, it, in terms of the short-term part of it, it's more aggressive than even the New Deal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not, not necessarily in terms of job creation by the state, which, you know, if you listen to the president, is, uh, is next on his agenda. I don't know if he's going to get to it. He's, he's talked about it many times before. Uh, but, uh, you know, to the extent that we move to a situation where uh, government has a greater role in the production of public goods uh, than it has over the last 40 years because no one is worried about government deficits, which they shouldn't be worried about. Um, you know, the, the, this, could, this could produce a real silver lining for, for Americans and for the economy and for the markets. Well, on that, um, you know, on the deficit, so I'll just show a picture so people have a frame of context. I always think for any time we're having a macro discussion, please have the time series that's available uh, of the statistic that we're talking about, in this case, the deficit slide 90, guys. Um, what, what I'm showing on this slide, Dan, is the unemployment rate uh, against the deficit, the growth rates of both. You know, what, what, what you find, obviously, is once you enter a recession, they both hook upward together and they hug each other, and it's, it's, it's not all that much fun. Um, but to your point, I mean, we're already, whether you like it or not, um, the deficit as a percentage of GDP is going to eclipse pretty much everything other than 08. Um, and that, what is the capacity for that? And where, where do you think that this actually, I've heard a lot of different opinions on this number. Um, where do you think the unemployment rate um, could go to? And where do you think the deficit as a percentage of GDP could go to? Well, of course, the deficit increased uh, over the last few years before this crisis yep. because of the tax cuts, not because of uh, policies such as the ones we're seeing right now. Um, the, the deficit increase, uh, you know, is, is really, uh, uh, you, you need to look at the deficit the way, the way I think uh, most people are starting to understand it. When you run a deficit at the government level, you're putting money into the economy. You're putting money into the private sector. Uh, it doesn't cost the government anything to actually create that money. It's a keystroke at the Fed. Uh, 
Um, the question is then whether or not you issue treasury bonds to fund it or whether you tax uh, to, to, to pay it down. Obviously, there's not going to be any increase in taxes for the foreseeable future, and I mean a long time. Um, so, you know, the real question is how do we, you know, to, uh, to the extent that we don't want to purely monetize, uh, you know, how much incremental treasury bonds that are not owned by the Fed are going to find their way into the market? My argument is none. Uh, effectively, the Fed is going to continue to buy an amount in the secondary market equal to whatever the treasury produces, it, it, you know, with primary dealers. Um, so, you know, effectively, if you took the if you if you just lifted the curtain uh, and and looked at this in a on a consolidated basis, the Fed is basically buying all the new issuance. Um, and what is the capacity to do that? The capacity is infinite. Yeah. You know, uh, from an <laughs> operational standpoint, it's infinite. The only restriction is uh, is inflation, right? At what point do you uh, create so many dollars in household pockets that they run out? chasing the classic definition of inflation, which is too much money chasing too few goods. Well, we have no shortage of goods in this global economy. Uh, one of the problems is that we need to start looking at inflation on a global level, meaning you can't just look at goods production in the U.S. the way they did 40 years ago uh, and, look at, uh, and, and look at demand in the U.S. and say, okay, well, if we have more demand than we have supply, we're going to get inflation. That's what we saw in the 1970s. Um, but today, uh, you know, the, as, as I started at the very beginning of this conversation, the amount of potential uh, production is is not only not only far exceeding demand; it's it's growing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we can continue to uh, uh, to pivot uh, to the production of public goods. To, you know, I'm not a big fan of universal basic income at all. I like to get my some bang for my buck. If we're going to pay people, let's <laughs> you know. Let's let's build something, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so you know we can we can rebuild our bridges and our airports and do anything the hell we want until we literally see the whites of inflation's eyes. Uh, that's that's the key, and and that's the way we should be running our economy. It's the way we should have been running our economy for the last ten years. Um, and uh, and you know now that now that you have two things that have fallen into place, you've had a Republican president who has uh, created an enormous deficit by virtue of tax cuts that, you know, favored the, the better off. Um, and now you have this, this horrible crisis that's going to lift that deficit by trillions of dollars. Uh, you've now got, uh, you know, people uh, who are, um, you know, going to receive that money far more directly than tax cuts to the rich. Um, and you're going to see the benefit of that money floating into the economy far more directly. Um, that is going to create a very interesting picture uh, and certainly a rebuke to those people who favored austerity in the past. Uh, you know, we can continue to do that for some time. Uh, and I mean, you know, probably a decade, I guess, um, to, uh, to improve the, the, the lot of our, of our society. And I hope that we do that. Well, uh, you know, the interesting part, and you made this point, is that you know whether you're of the ultra-conservative ilk uh, or of the austere community, it doesn't matter what you think. This is what's happening. You know, so again, that's the space I deal with. You'll find that I don't have an opinion really on people's opinion on what it should or could or would be. I'm dealing with what is, and what just happened is. So, um, you know, with that, like in mind, I wonder if you have an opinion on this in terms of, and tie it maybe if you can to the election. Um, you know, you have the likes of Stephanie Kelton out there uh, at Stony Brook. I, I think most people listening to this know who she is. If you don't, you should look it up. Um, and es essentially what I think is, is a modern, uh, like at least the initial version of MMT going on anyway. Um, and then you have, you know, two presidential candidates. She was, she's of course, I think she's still Bernie's um, advisor. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter if she is or not. But you have no, that. Not, not this time around. Not this time around. But you have that view. And then you have Trump. And to me, like, at, at least to me, Trump would be wide open uh, the way he's behaving right now. It sounds like he would quite like the idea of MMT as well. Well, I, I think that, you know, Trump as a populist was very attractive and obviously as a real estate guy, you know, his attitude is more leverage, the better. Uh, and uh, and if you can borrow cheap, borrow money. Yep. Um, so while his understanding of this is not is not equivalent to Stephanie's understanding, <laughs> um, you know, he, he does understand the basic fact that if 
if there's too much capital floating around in the world and that capital is not being put to productive use and merely being hoarded because, you know, what, what, when, when, you know, people talk about China owning treasury uh, securities and yeah, they own a bunch of treasury securities, but they own that, that that's their version of the mattress, right? They, they, they're sticking, they, they have to put it somewhere. Uh, and they might as well make a few bucks on it if they can. Uh, but their primary purpose in owning those treasury in, in holding those dollars to begin with is to not convert them into RMB, to sterilize those dollars and prevent them from increasing the value of their domestic currency. And so they're going to hold them. And of course, they're going to invest them in treasuries. That's the only place to efficiently store them when you have sizable amounts. I mean, you can't just, you know, go and, uh, and, and you know, to, to the extent that they don't buy a treasury bill, they keep them in an account at the Fed. So it's one way or the other. Um, but the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the issue is, uh, you know, the, 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 the huge amount of stranded money that's not being put to productive use because there's no uh, private sector uh, opportunities to uh, increase capital spending in a way that creates jobs and growth. Um, you know, that, that money is, uh, it really ought to be tapped by the one entity that can borrow it cheap, which is the entity that owns the printing press with which to pay it back. Right. I mean, there's, there's zero risk of the U.S. being able to repay its bonds. It, 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 it just presses that key on the computer and uh, and the bonds are repaid. Control, alt, print. Yeah, I, I want I, I well, I yeah. guess we're, I, we're all okay. going to get a piece of that. But, you know, we applied for the SBA thing. Anybody, any, anybody who's got a brain yeah. should have done that. Um, but what do you, where do you think it ends up on the election? Like, do you think that the Kelton uh, view would just be a bipartisan view that both parties would support? Well, I, I don't think we're going to, you know, I wrote a column uh, uh, for Business Insider last week, or maybe it was the week before, called We're All Modern Monetarists Now, right? It was a takeoff on yeah. uh, Milton Friedman's We're All Keynesians Now. But, it, and, it, and it's true, at the end of the day, I think everybody's waking up to the notion that a country that issues a currency in which it borrows exclusively um, can borrow as much as it wants, or actually doesn't even need to borrow at all. In theory, you could just monetize its spending. Uh, actually just, you know, print the dollars and spend. I know that's not legal, but uh, it, it, as an economic matter, it's totally doable. Um, so, you know, that, that, that is one of the things that's coming out of this uh, in the, to the tune of trillions of dollars. And it's never been uh, done before. It's obviously needed. Thank God uh, everyone got their act together quickly. It's really quite, quite remarkable, just as an aside. You know, the, the, it, we, there's a lot of bitching and moaning about how long it took Congress to get that bill through. But, you know, and, and I hate to think that it takes a plague to get Congress to legislate. Uh, but but it but it but it worked and people actually got it. And there were you know, there were a couple of wackadoodles off on the side who were saying, no, oh, we can't do this. We can't do this. They were crushed by the by the leadership in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, th this this is a, a, a huge issue, and it's one that's going to uh, uh, going to reverberate through the economy and through politics uh, going forward. Let me put it this way: uh, If Donald Trump uh, thinks that uh, this economy needs a, a, a shot in the arm in order to get him reelected, uh, you're you're not going to hear a lot of people pushing back on uh, a major infrastructure bill. You know, the biggest question when you go up on the hill, and I've done it many many times is, okay, this is great. I see the economic benefit of infrastructure spending. I see the, inf the economic benefit of borrowing. And by the way, when I was making those arguments, the 10-year rate was at 3%. You know, today it's at 75 basis points. <laughs> I understand the benefit of borrowing cheap and how we can make a lot of money by borrowing cheap and reinvesting and rebuilding our country, putting you know people in higher wage jobs, uh, having them spend money, procuring our steel domestically instead of from China, all the things that we can control if we do public goods as opposed to the private sector who just wants to buy everything as cheap as possible. Um, you know, everybody says, I see those benefits, and then the conversation ends with, but how are we going to pay it back? Yeah. And when I turn to them and I say, why are you worried about that? I can walk you down the block to the Mint and show you how are you going to pay it back? You're just going to print the money and you're going to pay it back. And people will start talking about the 1970s and debasement of the currency. And it's like you're it's like you're in the Middle Ages um, when you have conversations like that. But, you know, the, the word debasement came out of people actually uh, 
clipping pieces of gold off the currency, right? Um, you know, the, 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 this is nonsense. Uh, and, you know, we, the one thing that has disproven all of these concerns is the screaming dollar itself. Um, you know, the dollar has been on a tear uh, throughout uh, the, the post-recession period uh, in a way that, that flies in the face of all of the, the deficit worries and all the other concerns. The, the one thing I, I just want to point out to you, Keith, you'll remember this because do you remember right at the beginning of the, of the global financial uh, crisis, um, oil spiked. Remember it spiked yep. to like 150 dollars a barrel. And it was all it was all option it was all option contract trading. Mm -hmm. What was going on at the time is everybody assumed that the dollar was going to devalue massively uh, because of the government intervention and all of this money printing. And so people started using when I say people, including the Chinese and other people who were formerly holders of U.S. Treasury debt, uh, you know, they they started to rotate into oil contracts as a as an alternative storage place for dollars. Right. That caused this massive spike mm -hmm. well just the opposite is happening right now think about that yeah there is no other place to go except greenbacks and what you saw uh 20 days ago now i guess it was when the dollar when when the uh treasury rate spiked i forget how many yep. days are we into that <laughs> it's like what three days weeks ago. So, anyway no. but uh, all right two weeks ago right that that was that was a grab for greenbacks that was that was you know literally people wanted to be not in marketable securities, not in treasuries. They wanted a, they wanted cash. Yeah, they wanted dollars. They, were getting exactly. margin, they wanted dollars. They were getting margin called. They wanted liquidity. They wanted all sorts of things. You know, the dollar is king right now, and it's going to continue being that for a long time. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. I mean, our biggest positions are long dollars, long treasuries, um, and gold would probably be in third next to my to my wine. I guess I got to have a liquid asset that I can consume as well. But the, um, you know, on the on 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 the the deficit myth, I think that's actually the name of Kelton's book. I mean, she, you know, that's really a thing that's no longer a myth. It it is it is happening. So I, I encourage people to not, you know, be viscerally impacted by you know some of the things that Dan said. That's exactly what's going on. There's no there's really now now your task is to understand it. It's not to really fight it. I don't know how you could fight against it actually happening. When people tell me I can't fight the Fed debt, I kind of giggle. I'm like, well, I buy what the Fed buys every friggin' day that they're down, which are treasuries. Right. So um, what is kind of interesting is that the dollar does provide you know, kind of an anti-gravitational device. Like people that do believe that the Fed doing what you just said, and maybe that's uh, my last question before I take questions. If you guys have questions, please pop them in the queue. Uh, people vote on your question, so if it's a good question, I'll ask it. Um, but, you know, that's that's a question that I get all the time. Like, how can you say that, Dan, you know, that they just hit the button and they're just going to keep hitting the button and that the dollar can't go down? Like, people are apoplectic about that. All right. Well, so it all comes down to transmission, right? You, you need you need the dollar to actually uh, create uh, spending, right? Right now, let's face it. You can't spend there's nothing to spend it on so just under <laughs> exactly. the current crisis right under the current crisis scenario let me put it this way amazon couldn't deliver enough to move the needle right so so there's nothing to spend money on right now so that's not going to have any effect but a after we come out of this um could you see some minor dislocations in prices yeah sure uh you know you could see a, a momentary inflationary blip in one particular asset. You know, people are thinking, well, maybe food, but I don't think food's going to be the thing since everyone's continuing to eat um, during during the crisis. Uh, but, you know, there, there may be one or two things that you see a couple of little uh, spikes with because there's been so much money pushed in the economy. But again, you have to look at that relative to available supply. And available supply is not just domestic, it's global. Yeah. Um, and one of the problems, one of the problems with monetary policy as opposed to fiscal policy is so much of it leaks abroad, right? You, you, uh, you create uh, uh, increased, sure, you create increased demand by, by dropping uh, mortgage rates because you, you reduce in inflation, uh, reduce interest rates rather. Uh, and you, uh, uh, and that money, you know, consumer goes out, it's lower mortgage payment, there's more money available to spend. He goes out and spends, but a lot of that spending finds its way to China, for example. So, you know, that's, that's, that's what I call leakage from monetary policy. We're going to have the same thing here. There's no difference with the transmission mechanism. It's you're still putting money in people's pockets. Um, and so, you know, the idea that somehow this time, 
we're, we're going to see this, you know, sort of 1970s effect. And, you know, look, in the 1970s, we legitimately had 30 years of wealth creation that had made American households very wealthy, had a, a really high savings rate, and people wanted stuff. And we weren't manufacturing stuff at a rapid enough clip and on an efficient enough basis to satisfy that demand. That produced frontline inflation. The inflation wasn't all that bad because, I mean, it was bad, but it was only 18 months ahead of wage inflation. So the pain that people felt for all those years was that wages weren't rising fast enough to right. keep up with the price rise. When Volcker stopped prices from rising, wages caught up and we were off to the Reagan expansion. But, but you know, that, that was a real effect. You're, there's zero chance of your experiencing that today, not with this enormous uh, oversupply that comes out of, uh, of, of the rest of the globe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, sure, you could build a wall around the, the borders of the U.S. economy and you'd have massive inflation, mm -hmm. uh, and, but, but that's just not going to happen. That's a good explanation. All right, this first question. And, and um, I, should, I, should, I, I should finish by saying, without inflation, you can't tank the dollar, right? That, that's the necessary yeah. feature. Absolutely. Um, all right, this first question, uh, and this one's, I like that this question has a lot of votes, guys and gals, because, you know, when people ask about the market, like, I really don't know what you're asking. I know what I think about the market. I mean, so the question is, when, when does the market understand all that you think is going on here, Dan? And the market, to me, like if we're talking about the market, you know, the treasury bond market's got this. Uh, the dollar's figured it out. Commodities have figured it out. It's the stock market, I think, that the question's most likely implying. Um, I mean, you can, you, can, you, can, you can talk about the market broadly or the U.S. equity market specifically, but I think that when, when the, question, the question has to do with what's going on, like your view of unemployment, your view of, of consumption, your view of, of the actual recession or depression that we're in. Well, uh, two things. I think, number one, the stock market obviously declined to a panic level for a period of time. Uh, and I, I'm not saying that that bottom is not going to be tested in the future. There could be other things that give rise to, uh, to panics. But, you know, the bounce back from that panic level is, uh, you know, something that to, to be expected now that we have our arms around the dimensions of this crisis. Right now, the equity markets are trading on events. Uh, they're trading yep. on a uh, number of cases. They're trading on flattening the curve. They're trading on uh, expectations for uh, new tests and vaccines and what have you. Um, you know, the, these are all event driven uh, things in equities, as you know, I think you and I were both taught at an early age. Uh, bonds are bought. Equities are sold. Somebody needs to be willing to take risk. Uh, people need to invest. Uh, in bonds because they, they, you know, institutions need the income and they have roll off every day. So, you know, there's always demand for both treasury bonds and, and higher yielding bonds, meaning investment grade corporates and, you know, even to a certain extent, uh, uh, junk. But, um, you know, equities are, are something that somebody has to wake up in the morning and actually want to buy, either on a speculative basis or on a value basis. Um, relative to the last five years of history, it would look like there's some value in the market. Um, and so to have people reach consensus as they apparently reached over the last several days that, um, you know, it might be time to take advantage of some of that value if the market's stabilizing um, is not surprising. And that should that should go on. Are we going to get back to the sky high values that we were in February? No, of course not. Um, and, you know, probably not for, for uh, a, a very long time until the next cycle. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, you're, you're right. As usual, the bond market got it right. Uh, the commodities market is unduly affected by the, you know, the Saudi-Russia bickering, which, uh, you know, had an enormous impact on oil prices. I think, um, you know, when I, when I ran the numbers and figured out that on an inflation-adjusted basis, oil is cheaper now than it was the 1960s when I was a kid, <laughs> that was fairly startling. Yeah. Um, so... So, you know, the, 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 this situation, you know, may uh, uh, stabilize. I'm not saying oil is going to start going back up uh, to higher prices because, let's face it, long term, uh, it's, a, it's a dirty fossil fuel and there are going to be other things that are going to start to replace it, albeit, albeit that that will slow down because oil is so cheap. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the equity markets uh, are something that... Uh, uh, you know, there'll be clear profit taking. Yesterday we saw that in the afternoon. Uh, 
Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know how the market's going to close today. I'm not looking at my screen right now. I'm looking at you. Um, but uh, but I, I, I uh, you know, I, I don't think that um, uh, it, the, the direction of the equity market is going to be such that um, you, you want to uh, count on anything looking anywhere near like a V, uh, even a U. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're probably back, you're probably down to uh, uh, reasonable recoveries to, uh, to, to, to multiples that make sense with the understanding that a good chunk of the S&P 500 is going to have massively depressed earnings for a very long period of time. Yeah, that's the part that in you know one posted another shock 9/11 that people just quite couldn't quite get their arms around is the deleveraging of corporate balance sheets and the deleveraging of earnings. I mean, that was really the recession. You could barely see it, as you know, in 01. It was negative 0.3 percent, but uh, the stock market didn't bottom for a year a year after the economy hit its rate of change bottom. Uh, second question: This one I've never, actually never asked this one on Hedge Eye TV, but. I, I mean, I, I want to know Dan Alpert's uh, answer to this question. What, given Dan's economic and policy outlook, what one investment would he put his grandmother in today? <laughs> I thought you were going to ask boxers or briefs. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the, the, my, my grandmother, I wouldn't, I, I, my, my grandmother would be firmly in uh, uh, CDs and dollars. Yep. Uh, you know, the, the answer is you don't screw around with people who need their money in this market. This is not a growth environment for, uh, for people who need their cash. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest concern, obviously, is, um, you know, where do you go for dependable yield that is not, you know, treasury level um, and not, not bank CP level? Uh, you know, the, the, the where, where you should be tiptoeing around at this moment is looking at, uh, you know, preferred dividends. I mean, let's, let's face it, you know, common dividends are going to be under some pressure preferred dividends less so uh, and uh, you know there's there's uh, there's nothing sexy about buying preferreds or preferred stock funds um, but if you want to uh, to, to uh, produce a little bit more income uh, the value of these funds have, have fallen the value of some of the preferreds have fallen uh, just on a on a uh, not on an entirely uh, a rational basis but just on a reaction basis um, and uh, to the extent that you're trying to increase income a little bit, that's probably the only way to uh, to go right now. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be messing around in pure credit, meaning junk, uh, because uh, you know those 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 bonds are selling cheap for a reason. Yeah, I mean, people, I, I, you talk about like something that's boring. I mean, people don't quite get that. You know, the U.S. dollar is up almost four percent this year. I mean, relative to the alternative, I mean. Gold's had a pretty good move too. Treasuries have been fantastic, but I mean, it's not like it's nothing. You know, being in cash, I think people screw well, that up. Like they don't actually buy the currency. They, you know, yeah. they, they, they don't. They don't quite get that. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah. A, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll extend that just a little bit if you don't mind. The, the, there's, there's got to be a connection in investors' minds between inflation and investment decisions. Uh, you should take risk in an environment inflation threatens to erode purchasing power. Uh, inflation at zero or deflation. Uh, deflation is a situation where if you put your money on the table, it's, its purchasing power increases. Yes. You don't have to do anything with it, right? So that's your return right there. Uh, and the notion of taking meaningful risk in a disinflationary or deflationary environment to me is ludicrous. It always has been. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the human psyche is such that they, people look at nominal yields or nominal returns and they say, well, geez, it's too low. I can't stomach this. And they don't really focus on the issue of, they don't focus on the issue of, of, of purchasing power. Look, you can be making 10% in, a, in an environment where inflation is 10% and your real yield is zero, yeah. right? So it's, it's all relative. I think, I think it's just emblazoned into people's poor skulls that they, they you know, they're, they're watching what I affectionately call old wall TV and all they do is talk about stocks and, you know, that's what it is. Right. But um, uh, maybe last question here, and this is really is tied into that. You know, given your, like a lot of different kinds of ways people have asked this question, which is, you know, given your, and you've been you know, as consistent as anybody, I think, um, 
you know, Gary Schilling maybe would be, you know, right there with you, but, you know, per, you know consistent on... <laughs> Gary's got me beat. <laughs> yeah, he, I think it's just because he's got, like, a decade on you, maybe. But it's just, you know, yeah. uh, you're a young man. You know, Gary's still sending me his, his, uh, his honey. I love that stuff. I don't know if you're on that, on that distribution, yeah. but that stuff's awesome. That guy's great. Um, but, but the question, like, because you guys have been... You've just been right. I mean, I don't know how else you could say it. I mean, it's just been right on deflation is a much bigger risk than inflation. Being long treasuries, you know, it's certainly been one hell of a, a long-term hold. Um, but, you know, the question has to do with, like, what, what do you think the 30-year does? And could we have a 50-year? And, like, how, you know, people want to get into the, into the more and more and more. Like, do you believe that that can happen? 100-year bonds, uh, COVID bonds, they're talking about stuff like that. I, I've been a champion of, of increasing the the, the the tenor of bonds for a long time. I think it, uh, I think there's an appetite for it in the market. You know, Treasury goes in and they say, uh, they, they talk to the primary dealers and they say, how much demand do you think there'd be for a 50 or a 75 or a 100 year bond? And what, what, what are the dealers likely to say? They're not likely to say, yeah, sure, give us some of that paper so I lose demand for the 30 year securities I'm already holding, right? right? It, it, right? So, so no one's gonna say yes to that question. You actually have to do it. Um, and you know, there's there's other forms of uh, of issuance that should be considered. You know, back in the uh, in the 19th century, not to play historians, but the UK issued something called consuls, which are effectively annuities. They they, they were callable securities where they said, listen, I will uh, pay you at, the, at that time three percent every year, uh, and it's perpetual. I don't ever have to pay you back, um, but I can call you at any time. Uh, they were there were some call windows actually, but yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is also something that should be considered, uh, uh, which, which really does bring you down to the issue of, um, of, of whether or not uh, uh, government, you know, sort of like the Japan postal system or any other uh, comparable systems around the world uh, should provide what my, my writing partner, Bob Hockett, sometimes calls people's savings accounts. Uh, you know, effectively allowing people to, uh, to, to, we already have them, by the way, I don't know. Do you personally use Treasury Direct at all? I, don't, I, I do. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful service. Anyone can go on uh, online, open a Treasury Direct account, and you can buy Treasury securities on your own, no premium, no nothing. Um, and uh, you, you, can, you can bid in the auctions just like the primary dealers can. Yeah, it's cool. Um, except for limited amounts. So, you know, that, that is something that any investor should be considering uh, in terms of stashing away large amounts of money. Yeah, I, th I think people are getting educated, you know, on the topic. Again, I think it's kind of sad and pathetic that people didn't know that there was something other than stocks to invest in. But obviously, um, you know, the returns associated with being on the right side of the bond market uh, speak for themselves. Um, but, but again, I just want to, I, we're, our time's up here, Dan, but I wanted to thank you uh, and, and encourage people, by the way, if you haven't read The Age of Oversupply, not, not a lot of economic uh, long-term forecasts, if you will, will or, or your frameworks age well. Um, and I think you wrote that in like 2013, maybe, Dan? So that was yeah. you know, a while back. Great, great. I mean, it's not a call. It's just a framework by which you, you, you thought it through. And then, and, and of course, the job quality index. You've, you've done a lot of, you know, for people out there. And, and I think that you know, people should check that out and, and stay current with your views because... Uh, you're very additive to, to helping them uh, educate themselves, which is probably the, the, I always say that's probably the most important core holding you should have during times like these. So thanks for that. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and I hope everyone out there stays well and healthy and protects themselves and doesn't do anything stupid. Let's stay inside and keep each other from getting sick. Amen to that. He's, he's Dan Alpert. I'm Keith McCulley. You can find us both on Twitter. Thanks for joining us.